Boker Tov, everybody, and Erev Tov in Israel. I want to welcome, a pleasure to welcome Rachel Sharansky Danziger, who we had the pleasure of learning with um, last summer for one class in Sefer Shmuel, our, our, our Tanakh series. So now we're going to give her eight classes to develop themes a little bit more than you can do in one class. Uh, Rachel grew up in, in Yerushalayim, where she lives now. Uh, the, we has a degree in philosophy. She wrote her master's thesis on how people told their personal stories. And uh, and that's what she likes to do with stories and religion and emotion. She uh, writes for, for, for 929, and um, she's been writing a number of blogs recently on, on 929, on, on 929 in, in Times of Israel. And it's uh, a pleasure to welcome her to as we begin this eight-part series on storytelling and the rise of kings. Bakasha, Rachel. Thank you so much, Rabbi Kalman, and uh, it's uh, lovely to see uh, new and old, uh, new and familiar faces here. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, but before I do anything, before I delve into the material, before I talk about the Hebrew Bible, which is, after all, the occasion we this is the reason we're here to talk about the Hebrew Bible. But before we go there, I want to share something with you. This is not the first time. I taught this course. And the first time I taught it, my daughter, who was four years old at the time, um, asked me, mommy, what are you going to do today? And I was so moved that my young daughter is seeing me embarking on a teaching journey and that I get to be a role model to her and inspire her to pursue her passion as an adult one day, God willing, that I was just so enthusiastic. And I told her, I'm going to teach a class. It's called uh, storytelling and the rise of kings and she said oh what is it about so I said oh well it's about this major geopolitical shift that took place in ancient Israel and how it coalesced us from a group of tribes into a united nation but really it's also about the way stories are told and the way uh, the biblical storyteller is creates certain expectations that then subvert and complicate the process of dialectics between reader and text and reveal hidden layers of meaning, the challenge, the overt meanings. And, and then I raised my eyes and kind of looked into her face and I saw that her eyes were a bit glassy and her jaw was a little bit slack. And then she said, but mom, and I'm kind of paused my anecdote here. Now this really happened. And if you ask me later, I will tell you what she said, but I'm not going to tell you that now. But even though I'm not going to tell it to you though, I'm willing to bet that at least some of you have some sort of sense of where the story is going. Am I right? You can just nod if you agree with me. It's uh, you, you have a sense, you, you know where it's going. You know that somehow it's going to be, uh, it's gonna end up as a self-deprecating kind of episode that will poke fun at me for speaking with all this grand and pompous vocabulary to a four-year-old, right? And why do you know that? How do you know? You weren't there in the room with me. You weren't there, right? And yet you know. And you know because the way I told the story created certain expectations in your mind. The vocabulary I chose, all these like exaggerated pompous words which nobody in the right mind would use to talk to a four-year-old um, kind of set it up the way I created a contrast between her innocent question and her facial appearance, her glassy eyes and slack jaw, and my enthusiasm also set you up to see that this is where it's going. The truth is that it's even not just the verbal choices I made, even just my tone of voice probably hinted to you as to where it's going. Forget even tone of voice, forget anything I did. The very fact I told you the story at the beginning of this course already set up certain expectations because there's a long tradition of teachers, educators, instructors sharing some sort of uh, self-deprecating anecdote in the beginning to break the ice and get everybody in a good mood, right? It just, it's, it's almost to be expected. So in other words, I'm using not only the verbal cues or the facial expression or uh, the intonation to create these expectations, but also the placement of the story in the beginning of this eight class journey. Now, of course, this is not unique. This is what storytellers do always. Every storyteller doesn't seemingly tell us this happened, this happened, this happened, but rather they somehow invite us to engage in the process of the creation of the story. They somehow make us develop certain expectations 
and then wait to see how these expectations are either fulfilled or frustrated. And that helps us feel those moments when we listen to a story of, aha, I saw it coming, or wait, where did this come from? And if the story dollar teller does the job well, the feeling of where did this come from is not going to leave us disaffected with a story and kind of, okay, I don't like that. I don't see why, why that's interesting, but rather feeling something along the lines of, oh, that's really surprising. Let's read on and see how it's gonna fit in with the rest of it all. And the question, the, the big question is, why is it so important? Why can't the storyteller simply just tell us that something happened or make up something that happened about dragons? I don't know. Why do we, why do good stories require our emotional participation? Now, I know it's going to be very difficult to have discussion in this class because we're so many, so I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to invite you to share right now. I will try and make um, room for questions and answer in a more open discussion later through the chat. Um, but I want to invite you to think for a second for yourself. W what is it about stories? Why do stories require us to think? Why do stories require us to guess, to project certain expectations into the future and then see when we reach that future, whether they meet it or not? The answers can vary. I don't think there's one answer, but I think that, and later in the question and answers time, I'll be happy uh, to hear your suggestions and your thoughts about it. But I think that a lot of the answers are going to lead in one direction, which is that stories that simply tell us something happened are not interesting to us. For a story to be interesting for us, we have to feel like there's a deeper meaning, like we're getting something extra out of it. Let's look together at the source sheet for a second. In their amazing book about narrative in the Hebrew Bible, David Gunn and Donna Fuel wrote, while they may be structured, and it's source in the box number one, while they may be structured around real life experiences, literary plots differ from real life. Whereas in real life, events often seem random, narrative shapes events into meaningful patterns. Our lives, even particular episodes in our lives, do not have the distinct parameters that we find in literary plots, nor for that matter, are they commonly accorded obvious meaning. Consequently, while plots must be similar enough to real life so that we can understand and relate to them, they must also be different in order for us to appreciate them. We see enough disjointedness in everyday life. When we read, we expect to see significance. In other words, if I was to put a tape recorder, do they even have that anymore? I don't even know. If I were to put a tape recorder in a coffee shop, I live on Amaker Fame Street in Jerusalem. If any of you know it, you know there's a lot of coffee shops. Let's say I go downstairs, turn around, walk into a coffee shop and put, let's say, a video camera. And then later I transcribe everything that that video camera captured. Every conversation, every please pass me the salt and where is my check yet? And why did you forget to tell the babysitter to pick the kids up? Whatever happens to uh, be spoken. You record everybody's movements. Um, okay, you, you re, re, sorry, you um, record everybody's um, movements. You say somebody uh, walked across the street, this person went to the bathroom, this waiter finished her shift at 3.30. And you say, now I'm gonna take all of that, everything that happened, all the snatches of information that were discussed, everything, and I'm gonna send it to a book publisher and say, I have a book here called An Hour at the Coffee Shop in Jerusalem. No one in their right mind will call that a story. We don't care. We don't care about the snatches of dialogue of people's lives. We don't care about the boring things people say to each other when they ask each other to pass the menu. We don't care. It's not interesting. We have enough of that in our own life with our own forgetting to pick up the babysitter or uh, passing the soldier and all that. We don't need that from a story. When we go to a story, we want something extra. And here is the interesting thing. When we look at the painting, for example, or at a statue or at other forms of plastic art, we can get the meaning immediately. There's something immediate about how we get meaning from a statue. I mean, sometimes if we think about it more, we'll get more, but 
the perception happens immediately. Stories don't work this way. If all I see is the first sentence of a story or some random uh, sentence from the middle of the story, that doesn't mean anything to me. It only means something because there are things happening one after the other, after the other, after the other. And somehow the way they are arranged makes me experience something that leads me to feel like I grasp some meaning that goes beyond just a just disjointedness of regular life. But how, when we experience a story, how are we supposed to organize all these impressions? We read a sentence and a sentence and a sentence and all kinds of new characters and new dialogues and new themes and new things that are introduced. How are we supposed to arrange it? How are we supposed to be able to um, grasp all of it and follow it and see the meaning unfolding? And this is where expectations come to place. And this is where we're coming back to the story I told you in the beginning about my daughter and my pompous speech about this class. Expectations do more than set us up for a punchline and a joke. Expectations in a narrative story serve as little tour guides. They take us through the story. They make us pay more attention at certain parts and know that we can kind of skim through at other parts. They make us um, be ready for something to happen and then be surprised when it doesn't or something else happens and therefore dig in and start grasping the threads that will eventually become the meaning that the story is somehow supposed to impart. In other words, without those expectations that the storyteller creates within us, thus inviting us to participate, a story falls apart. A story becomes a pile of disjointed ideas, themes, plot lines, characters, legs, arm, pass me the menus, etc. And in that regard, the stories of the Hebrew Bible, despite their very different status in our mind from just, you know, Little Red Riding Hood or Frozen or that joke that somebody told you yesterday, whatever it is, despite the fact that they, we treat them with reverence and that they occupy such a huge um, place in our, in our collective identity in our collective consciousness or in collective understanding of the world, they're still stories. And they still work by creating certain expectations, using those expectations to guide us through them and make us through those expectations, notice certain things and grasp onto certain things that will later help us understand the meaning that unfolds. And what we're going to do in this course, what we're going to do today and then in the next seven meetings, and I hope uh, to see you then, is try and tap into those expectations, try and see what is the biblical storyteller trying to make us feel or think or expect at given moments? And how does the story use that expectation to surprise us or educate us or challenge us or raise difficult theological um, questions? So now that we have a bit of an understanding of what we're gonna do today, I wanna open it. Um, I just wanna give a minute or two for questions, comments until now, and then we're gonna delve into the actual biblical story. So if you have questions, could you please post them in the chat and I'll read them out loud. Um, Susanna Urgent. shares that she has a tape recording. Yes. If somebody feels more comfortable and you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, that's, that's maybe also even better. Us. Yeah, yeah. Comments, disagreements. Shtika kahoda. Okay. So either I overwhelmed you like I did my daughter and, <laughs> and spoke too much and too fast and too enthusiastically, or you're all in a perfect agreement with me, which is hard for me to believe. So I'll try and, uh, <laughs> I'll try and uh, um, rein in my own enthusiasm a little bit also. But um, oh, I, I, think this is oh, what I, I think this is a marvelous perspective on the biblical narrative that I never thought about before. Thank you, Susanna, and I hope that uh, the I hope that we will be able to really develop it together. Oh, uh, Zev Kaufman is asking me. So, what did my daughter say? So, you know what? To keep you all engaged, I'm going to tell you that at the end. Can you ask me that at the end again? <laughs> It'll be a surprise, and then it's going to be a disappointing answer. But you know, that's the cost of dragging a joke for too long. Okay. So, anybody else wants to say something? If not, I'm going to continue. Okay. 
So we talked about stories in general, but we're not going to talk about stories in general. We're talking about a very particular story in this course. And it's a very grand story. It's, it's one of the biggest stories in terms of how filled to the brim with plot lines and complications that we have in our history. And that's a story that starts after Yoshua takes the Israelites across the desert, across the Jordan River, leads them in a war of conquest, helps them settle down or at least divide the land amongst the different tribes, dies, and now what? What happens next? And so starts a story that will start with the tribes being separate tribes, fighting separate wars, having separate problems for a few centuries. During those centuries, we will see everything from local wars to civil wars, or as we call them in Hebrew, milchamot achim, brothers wars, not only civil, it's, it's family. It's a matter of family, it's a matter of blood. We will see um, leaders, um, we will see one leader sacrificing his daughter. We will talk about that next week. We will see other leaders, nameless leaders, fighting a civil war after another woman was raped. And eventually we will see how from that state of warring, disconnected, disaffected tribes will rise, will coalesce one united Israelite kingdom. Now that will be complicated too. That's got, first there's gonna be one king, then there's gonna be a contender king, then they're gonna not get along so well, and there's gonna be more civil wars. Then when the second king, David, finally rises, his own son is gonna start a rebellion against him. Stories are never simple and Jews are never simple, right? But um, there's a lot. There's a lot that we're going to try and grasp and handle. And it's certainly too much and too messy if we don't have some tour guides to lead us through it. So today we're gonna to look at the moment when it all begins, at the very, very beginning of the book of Judges, and we're going to see what expectations this beginning tries to engender within us. And therefore, what tour guides are going to serve us as we start walking and journeying through all these different plot lines and complications and events that are to come within three centuries and three biblical books, Judges, Samuel 1 and Samuel 2. So let's look together at the beginning. I am in box number two, it's also page number two, at the very beginning of um, the book of Judges. I don't have, um, I'm not going to highlight, I'm just going to tell you I'm right here. I'm in, in this, uh, right here. I'm going to read in English, but you have the Hebrew right in front of you if you want to see it as well. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites inquired of the Lord, which of us shall be the first to go up? Now, I want to pause here and say that in Hebrew, it doesn't say which of us shall be the first to go up? It says, Miya ale lano, who will rise for us? Who will go up for us? And this is significant. We'll come back to it in a minute. Against the Canaanites and attack them. The Lord replied, let Judah go up. Note that in Hebrew, it does not even, it doesn't say the tribe of Judah. It just says Judah, Yehuda. I now deliver the land into their hands. Judah then said to their brother tribe, Shimon, in Hebrew, it doesn't say brother tribe, just says Achiv, his brother. Come up with us to our allotted territory and let us attack the Canaanites and then we will go with you to your allotted territory. So Shimon joined them. So I'm going to again open it for discussion. Let's try and see if we can do it with just unmuting ourselves if you wanna speak up. What kind of expectations do these short three, um, short three verses engender? What do you think is going to be the theme? What's going to be the protagonist? Yes, Batya, I see. Yeah, what, what's interesting is, and I don't know if everybody's aware, that the tribe of Shimon is like in, um, a, is surrounded by Yehuda. It's, it's within Yehuda. It has to do, um, most probably as part of the, the punishment that Shimon got to keep him under control from the Shimon Levi thing. So that uh, they're a team. I mean, they, Shimon can't go with anyone else without escaping uh, Yehuda. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it, it's a good point that um, it's a very natural alliance. It's not random that, uh, sorry, it's not random that uh, Yehuda is asking Shimon to go with them. Shimon's, is, Shimon's land is surrounded by Yehuda's land. So that's true. I'm not going to go into the story of, is it a punishment or not? Because I'm trying to stay on the level of the pshat, just what's written in the text right now. Um, Ilana um, Stein wrote, uh, it will be more conquest stories, which is very true. It's, it says so directly. It's, it's not a overt, careful, it's not a, a covert expectations. It just tells us immediately, this is going to be about conquest. Naomi Finkelberg points out that it's going, that. The book starts with a certain leadership vacuum that there's a question of who is going to be the leader. Anybody else wants to speak up? Just to follow up on who's going to be the leader and yet and then the first name forward is Yehuda and Yehuda pulls in Shimon and that's I mean forgetting you know that's just very interesting and then you say well where, what about everyone else like all these questions arise in your head as we see this, these just first few sukim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, um, I, I would like to unpack a little bit what you said, Rebecca, and say slightly more um, generally that they ask a question, but it's not a simple question. It's not so clear what it means, who will rise up for us, right? It's not so clear. Do they mean who will go and fight first? Does it mean who's gonna be our leader in the war to come? Does it mean, what exactly does it mean? And then the answer is Yehuda, but we also don't know exactly, again, because we don't know exactly what the question means, we don't know what the answer means. Yael Ziegler, in her book about Ruth, not about Shafim, in the book about Ruth, points out something interesting. She says that you can interpret the question, who will rise up for us, in two very, very distinct ways. You can interpret it to mean um, who will be our leader. And if that's the question, then what we're supposed to imagine is that now Yehuda is going to be like a leader of all the tribes and all the wars over all the lands. Or you can interpret it to say, of the wars to come, who should fight for their land first? Who should be the first one to fight? As we will see, the people seem to interpret it, or at least Yehuda seems to interpret it the second way. They're not interpreting it in a, in a sense of general leadership, but rather in a, in a sense of, okay, fine, we'll fight our war. And then Yehuda and Shimon fight their war and they stop. They have nothing to do with the other wars to come. I wanna see what um, the answers in the chat are, just a moment. Some excellent uh, thoughts here. Um, Judah is the leader and Shimon is the warrior. There's some expectation. I would say that Judah is also perceived as a warrior through this, uh, but I agree. Um, Ilana Stein says, and it will be someone from Yehuda as protagonist. So I'll get back to the protagonist issue in a second. Um, Harriet says Yehuda goes beyond what is instructed. So again, either he goes beyond what is instructed or lehefech, the other way around, he's going less. Maybe what he's instructed to do is to lead everybody and instead he just conquers his own land. It's not so clear yet what's supposed to happen. Um, Zev Kaufman wrote, why does Yehuda even ask Shimon to join him when God instructed them alone? Excellent question. There's something kind of odd about Yehuda's behavior. It's not such a clear and obvious response, even though, as, um, as was pointed out before, the fact that their lands are kind of intertwined perhaps is, might, be a, might be an answer or lead us to an answer. And Naomi Baryam wrote, it's going to be a bloody story conquering the land without a clear leader or plan. True, very, very clear that the theme or the immediate plot to come has to do with blood, it has to do with blood and land, with war and with settlement of the land. And, but the theme is not so much conquest as it is leadership. Because before we even talk about let's start the war, we start talking about leadership. Who will rise? The first question that hovers above is who will rise? So we already have this expectation at the back of our mind that somehow this is going to be a book. This is going to be a story where the issue of leadership is central, is front and center, which in fact it will be. 
but perhaps not in the way we see it right now. A moment, uh, two more answers in the chat. Uh, this creates a split, Chaim Fruchterud. Would you like to elaborate on that, Chaim? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, if you do, please write more or, or speak up. Yeah. Do you read me? Mm hmm No, I'm not reading you. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Chaim. Uh, basically, the fact that Yehuda is asking Shimon, you know, the other tribes, it's not only Shimon, not only Yehuda's problem, it's mm -hmm. by itself creates already a split. Mm -hmm. What so, about, the other, about, the, about the other tribes? Yes, that's a very good point. And this is also, thank you, Chaim. This is also the direction that Yael Ziegler takes it when she analyzes it in her book about Ruth. She points out that the very fact that Yehuda interprets this question, we said it can be interpreted in two questions in terms of general leadership or who goes first. And he interprets it as I go first and okay, I'll make a little pact to go with Shimon, but what about all the other tribes? There's a certain without, they don't need to start fighting against each other for us to already see the seeds of a very separatist kind of self-perception on the part of the tribes, at least on the part of Yehuda. The very fact that Yehuda interprets God's answer of you go first as by yourself or with one tribe and then you're done already hints to us that part of what the story we're about to examine is going to be about is the way these tribes see themselves not so much as one united group, but rather a separate entity. Uh, as uh, Harriet wrote, tribal thinking, um, and Susanna Levin wrote, uh, Moshe designated Yoshua. Yoshua didn't, didn't, sorry, designate a successor, which is a very good point. It's, and it's a little bit remarkable. Let's look again at the source. Let's compare it with what happens at the very beginning of Yoshua, the previous book of the Bible. So I'm here at the same box looking at the, this source, Yoshua 1, 1 to 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Yehoshua, son of Nun, Moshe's attendant, my servant Moshe is dead, prepare to cross the Jordan together with all this people into the land that I am giving to the Israelites. Who initiates the conversation here? This was God. Exactly. Not only did Moshe- no, She was... had been with Moshe throughout the, the previous uh, time as his assistant. So it was a natural progression. Mm -hmm. Correct. So both Moshe designated him, but also he's the kind of leader whose leadership is um, not only declared by God, but also almost initiated by God, God taps him and says, okay, start leading. You, stand up. Now, kum, the word kum here in, uh, in Hebrew, which in English they translated as uh, prepare to cross. It's more like stand up, which is often used in biblical uh, Hebrew to, to uh, mean something along the lines of, you know, take control of the situation, kind of rise to the moment, go ahead. Now is your time to do the thing that you have to do. So God tells him, get up, get going, rise to the occasion, and Yoshua does it. But this is not what happens in the beginning of Shoftim. In the beginning of Shoftim, if you look at the source, at the source from Shoftim here, you'll see who starts the conversation. Bnei Israel. The people, the Israelites, the sons of Israel, are the ones who go to God and say, okay, we recognize that our work here is not over. Who's gonna be the first to rise for us? And this marks a tremendous shift. I can't overstate it, how big of a shift it is. It's easy to miss if we read too fast and we just kind of like blah, 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 Yoshua, blah, 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 conquest, blah, 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 dead, blah, 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 more conquest, judges, blah, 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 civil wars. But if we pause, if we allow ourselves to stop here for a second and look at it and try to understand what it means, what it means is that for the first time, the people as such can become the protagonist of their own story. This can stop for this one moment. It looks as if this can stop being a story about great men 
such as Moshe, Aharon, Yoshua, leading the people were kind of a Greek chorus of complaints in the background mostly, as we know if we read uh, the book of Numbers right now in Shul, it's just one complaint after the next, after the next, after the next. It's almost like the Greek chorus in the background. But the real movers and shakers, the real focal points of the story are the great man and the occasional woman like Miriam. For the first time, we are in a biblical story where a nation looks like it's about to take control of its own narrative. And we can't just see that and say, oh, the protagonist is gonna be this leader or that leader because nobody is tapped by name here, right? It doesn't say the president, the Nasi, the leader of Yehuda should be the leader. It doesn't say this dynasty or that person should be the leader. It says, let Yehuda rise first. So the protagonist can either be the entire Jewish people who are coming together asking what they should do next, or the protagonist could be this tribe of people. But one way or another, it seems as if we're moving past the personal households and stories that were the hallmark of everything from Abraham to Yehoshua, and we're going to watch national history unfold. This is the expectation. The expectation that we're getting from this is that it's going to be about war, that it's going to be about leadership, that there's going to be some tension around the tribes and whether they perceive themselves as united or not. We already see the seeds of this tension to come, but also that we are watching the birth of a nation that can tell its own story, that can shape and lead and initiate its own rising up to the occasion. But here's the thing. Stories are never wholly happy and easy. If there's no, um, if there's no uh, complications or setbacks or challenges, then a story is exceedingly boring. And I'd like to give you another example from my daughter. My daughter is a very useful source of examples like that. She, when she was little, she used to tell me a story. She said, once there was a girl and she wanted a rabbit and her parents got her a rabbit, the end. <laughs> And I said, okay, that's not a very, I mean, it's cute, but like there should be, and then an evil witch stole the rabbit or, and then her parents refused to get her the rabbit or, and then the rabbit became purple and ran away. Um, but this is not what happens. This is not what happens in your story. That's what I told her. And then she thought about it for a long time. And she said, okay, so once there was a girl, and she wanted a rabbit and her parents bought her the rabbit, but the rabbit became purple, so she cried. So she stopped being purple and she lived happily ever after. I said, okay, it's a step in the right direction. Let's, uh, for a four-year-old, this is very good, let's move on. And the book of Shoftim doesn't disappoint. It doesn't simply lead us from this moment of potential and hope and uh, you know, they're about to seize the moment and create their own story. It doesn't show us, uh, grand procession of them actually doing that. Instead, it almost immediately shows us failure. Now the failure is already hinted in the verses we read, as Yael Ziegler points out. It's already hinted in the fact that Yehuda and presumably the other tribes also read their story about who will rise, read, sorry, their question about who will rise first in this narrow separatist sense. By the way, the fact that the tribes are called here by their names without the word tribe, they're just called Yehuda, Shimon, might be supposed to remind us, it's, it's almost a reminder that before these were tribes, these were brothers who didn't get along <laughs> a long time ago. And that when those brothers, Yehuda, Shimon, Yosef, didn't get along, what we got was them selling their own brothers and eventually the exile of the Jewish story. So this is also a hint that not all is good and, and some things can go wrong. And then they go and deliver on this expectation of failure. Because what happens is that Yehuda and Shimon do conquer most of the land they're supposed to conquer. But when the other tribes set out one after the other separately, not in one great alliance, but rather each one separately, when they set out and conquer their lands, 
they succeed to a very limited degree. If we want to generalize, those lands that Israel has built, Israel has the, the, the Mediterranean, and then it has the seaboard, and then it has the Shvela, the place where going towards the center of Israel, the seaboard starts curving into these hill lands. And then the hills become the mountain, the mountain range that is the center of Israel, Judah and Samaria in today terms. And then it pretty much drops east into the valley of the, into the Jordan Valley. Those areas that are concentrated on the top of the mountains, more or less they conquered successfully. Almost anything else, almost everything that had, was in the flatlands or in the hills close to the flatlands, they only partially conquered. They either didn't succeed at conquering it from the various ethnic groups that lived there or they conquered only part of it. At some places, it seems like they made some sort of compromises, some sort of deals with the nations that lived there. By the way, the reason for it is not some big mystery. The reason for this disparity between the mountain range conquest and the failure to conquer the flatlands has to do with technology. The Canaanites and the, later the Philistines who lived in the flatlands had chariots. They had heavy weaponry, in other words, that was very easy to transport in the flatlands but couldn't serve them very well once the fighting got to the mountains. So all the wars that took place on the mountainside, the Israelites more or less succeeded in. But time and time again, when it came to dealing with those technologically superior groups that lived in flatlands and had chariots, they balked at the face of it. Now, if this was any other story, let's pretend like we don't know what happened next, right? We're following the expectations thread here. Almost every story, we see a certain glorious beginning, a certain promising beginning, setbacks, the people overcome the setbacks and there's a happy ending. So we wouldn't be too far off to expect something like that here. We're told in detail about how each tribe failed, what lands they didn't conquer, which means that it's reasonable to expect that the next thing we'll hear is about how after failing, they rallied up and conquered it anyway. But this is not what happens. Instead, in a very deus ex machina, God intervening from the machine move, God intervenes and says, you know what? These failures, I'm not going to treat them as a challenge for you to overcome and move on. These failures are so terrible. On some level, there's a representation of such deep sinfulness that I'm going to make it impossible for you to overcome them. Let's look at it in the sources. I'm going to box number um, four, God's interference. It's in Judges 2, 1, 2, 3. An angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up from Egypt and I took you into the land which I had promised an oath to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you, for your part, must make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You must tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. Look what you have done. I wanna pause here and note that the sin as the angel presents it is both the fact that they didn't fulfill, they didn't obey, but also that it's, a, it's on some level it's presented as an act of ingratitude. That I did my part of the covenant and you just dropped your part of the covenant even though I brought you here. And then he goes on to say, and this is the key sentence here in verse number three, therefore I have resolved not to drive them out before you. They shall become your oppressors and their God, gods shall be a snare to you. At this moment, God changes the story. If the expectation we had in the beginning is that this is going to be a story about conquering the land of Israel, we're now told that in the story, there's never going to be complete conquest. If we thought that the story is about um, taking initiative and grabbing their own faith and becoming the authors of their own story and successfully moving on to the next phase of peoplehood, we're now told that God himself decreed that they will never be fully capable of doing that. 
but somehow the story that they're about to live through, instead of a story of success, of conquest, of overcoming difficulties in order to establish the, the kind of society that God already in Egypt told them they must establish, instead of all that, this is going to be a story about endurance, about living with temptation in the form of the idols and with constant threats and oppressors in the form of the idol worshipers around them and having to endure and survive and somehow continue from generation to generation despite these difficulties. And I wanna pause here for a second and let it sink in. This is a very tragic story we're looking at and it's authored once again by God. Instead of being the story they author with God's blessing, it becomes a story that God forces on them by turning their mistakes um, into an ever-present companion, into something that no matter what they do, they cannot overcome. If we look at this story, if we take a step back for a second and look at the story here, um, I'll, thank you, I, I see the comments and I'll get to them in a minute. Um, once again, if we look at this story, if we take a step back from the story and look at it in the context of the project of the entire Hebrew Bible, the entire Jewish history from the creation of the world until uh, the end of, uh, until the Babylonian exile and the return from the Babylonian exile, which is as late as the Bible takes us, the Hebrew Bible takes us. There's something familiar about what happens here with our expectations and the way they are subverted. Because already in Eden, we had certain expectations about what the story of humanity is going to be. And the expectation was that the story of humanity was going to be living in Eden and taking care of the Garden of Eden. And then Adam and Eve ate the fruit and God, instead of saying, okay, but now let's overcome this said, no, now it's going to change the story. Now the story of humanity is going to be in exile from the Garden of Eden. Later, we saw a moment when uh, God said, the story of the Jewish people is going to be that you're all going to raise Kohanim. The firstborn of each and every Jewish family is going to serve in my home. And you're all going to have a share in my home. And we're all going to be tied together as a family. And we expected this glorious vision. And then Moshe went on top of the mountain and the people created the golden calf. And God said, no, I'm, I'm changing the story. Now I'm going to have one tribe be the servants in my temple. And the rest of you are going to be removed and away somehow from me and from my home. We saw the same things with the spies, with the, with the scouts in the desert. There's a certain story of we're going to come out of Egypt and go into the promised land. And instead, no, this generation is going to die. And now something else is going to rise. So, Time and time again, the biblical story creates certain expectations. People fail to rise to them. And instead of giving them an opportunity to rise again, God says, okay, but now we're in a different story. Somehow this failure is not just a setback for the hero to overcome in a fairy tale, but rather it changes the fabric of reality. And this is again what happens here. Now, before we continue, I want to look at the at the comments and uh, we'll discuss them uh, to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, Batya Medad pointed out that in the era of the judges, we will have some of, some of the best leaders will be uh, females, Ruth, Naomi, Dvora, and Hannah, and we will definitely discuss that in the, in the coming classes. Um, John Sachs writes, I find it interesting that the people are having a direct conversation with God in the beginning of judges, there is no intermediary, and they are the ones who approach God, not the other way around. And later, John also pointed out that after their sin, there's no longer direct interaction like that. After they sin, God sends an angel. He no longer speaks directly to the people, almost as though turning away from them, he sends an angel, which is a very good point. That They didn't only lose the initiative, they also lost that direct connection with God. Um, Dalia Hakimi wrote, what is the point of tribes altogether at this point in our history? Why does God still push this concept instead of unify us? I'll have to come back to that in a bit. Um, 
Gershon Hepner writes, the term Israel at the beginning of Shoftim implies that the book describes a democratic process, which is of course a problem that can only be solved by a legitimate king. Damn democracy seems to be the message of Shoftim. Um, it's very interesting because your comment echoes the thesis of um, philosopher Michael Walzer in his book, um, In God's Shadow which talks about what it means to be a political entity, which is a society, a Jewish society under God, when the, the main leader is always God. What does it mean to have political structures and political power when everything defers to God? And he points out that it almost seems that the system God pushes by giving them opportunities to kind of grasp that is more democratic. It's more everybody should be a part of it. Everybody should send one of their sons to work in the, in the temple. Everybody should um, be part of the polity in an equal way. The people as such should be the protagonists of their own story. But time and time again, reality in the form of people's shortcomings interferes. And it turns out that the people do want and need leaders, human particular leaders to lead them and take them forward. And we will see how that plays out. Uh, later. Um, Epi writes, the story of the Tanakh seems to constantly illustrate the idea that perfect is the enemy of the good. So that's one way to look at it. You could also say that perhaps the good is the enemy of the perfect. <laughs> it's uh, not so clear what's the, but I see what you're saying. That because I think what, I think it's true that by presenting these ideal possibilities, it almost sets us up to fail. It's important to note that the Bible could easily just gloss over those possibilities, right? We didn't need the full story. We could have just left out um, Eden. We could have left out God's original plan of bringing the same generation out of Egypt all the way to Israel. We could have just glossed over those embarrassing stories of failures and pretend in retro, in, uh, rev in true revisionist glory to pretend that that was the plan all along, right? That the plan all along was for the generation to die out in the desert, for only the tribe of Levi to serve, for judges to rise and fight for us instead of the people being arranged in a, a more uh, equal way or a more unified, cohesive way. We could pretend. The fact that the story doesn't let us pretend is important. You could make, for example, an argument that by showing us those expectations that are later subverted, by showing us God's expectations from us that we fail to rise to, it tells us that we still have the potential within us to rise to them eventually. That on some level, those promises, even though for now they're set aside, they're still part of our story. And we might, if we work hard enough, rise to them at some later point. By the way, since in this course, we're going to not mainly focus only on judges. We will see how they leave the judges era behind. We will also see that happen. We will see how some of the promises mm -hmm. that are shattered with the civil wars of judges, with the separatist perception of the different tribes, some of the expectations that are shattered will later, after a process of healing under the leadership of the prophet Shmuel, come into play again. But we will, I will have to leave that as a spoiler alert for the, for the later classes in this course. I'm going to go back to the chat and to people's comments in a bit. I want to continue for now with, the, with our journey. What happens is that the generation dies. The generation that failed to rise to the occasion dies. And the question is, what will happen now? And the text tells us the book of Judges is unique in the Bible in that it doesn't try to be cute about what should we expect, what kind of pattern we should expect from the rest of the book. It tells us directly in mm -hmm. chapter two, mm -hmm. sorry, Is, did somebody no. speak up? If not, then please just mute. No, I, I, I muted them, it's fine, it's fine. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. So let's, the book just tells us exactly what's going to happen in a cyclical pattern. It tells us this is going to happen with every generation. It's a little long, but we'll read through it and discuss it as we read through it. It's in box five, Judges two, uh, verses 10 to 19. And all that generation will likewise gather to their fathers. Another generation, sorry, 
arose after them, which has not experienced the Lord or the deeds that he had wrought for Israel. In Hebrew, what it says, it's bold in bold here, asher lo yaduet Hashem. They didn't know Hashem. Does that ring a bell to you? This phrase, asher lo yaduet, that they didn't know someone? Does that sound familiar from somewhere else? Joseph and Pharaoh. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and we'll see it here in uh, box seven, Exodus one. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation, but the Israelites were fertile and prolific. They multiplied and increased very greatly so that the land was filled with them. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Asher lo yadayt Yosef. The fact that the phrase is basically quoted here, alluded to here, tells us something very deep. It tells us that somehow the act of forgetting of this generation that they don't know God, not only is it like Paro's forgetting in the sense that it shows ingratitude. Paro forgets Joseph who saved Egypt in the time of disaster. The people forget the God who brought them from Egypt and brought them into the land and helped them, et cetera, et cetera. But it also tells us in terms of storytelling, something very startling. It tells us that not only did the people lose the initiative in their own story, but they also on some level became the villain. And not only a villain, the villain. Paro is the villain of our story. And somehow in some way, the people become the villains in their own narrative. Let's see what else happens after they forget. And the Israelites in verse 11, and the Israelites did what was offensive to the Lord. They worshiped the Baalim and forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods from amongst the gods of the people around them and bowed down to them. They provoked the Lord. In other words, the act of forgetting led to an active straying away from the covenant. And God wasn't going to take that uh, lying down, so to speak. Then the Lord was incest at Israel and he handed them over to foes who plundered them. Um, a moment, I'm going to make it a little bigger. To uh, foes who plundered them. Uh, I'm here in the middle of verse 14. He surrendered them to their enemies on all sides and they could no longer hold their own against their enemies. In all their campaigns, the hand of the Lord was against them to their undoing as the Lord had declared and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in great distress. So we already see the beginning of a pattern. They forget, they leave God, they stray from God, God helps their enemies, and they find themselves in great distress. And then God changes his mind. In verse 16, then the Lord raised up chief stains and delivered them from those who plundered them. When the Lord raised up chief stains for them, the Lord would be with the chief stains and would save them from their enemies during the chief stains life. For the Lord would be moved to pity by their moaning because of those who oppressed and crushed them. But when the chief stain died, they would again act basely even more than the preceding generation following other gods, worshiping them and bowing down to them. They omitted none of their practices and stubborn ways. What we're told here is once again, the pattern of the story changes. In the beginning, in the very beginning of Shutim, it seemed like the pattern of the story is going to be, there's a goal, conquest, there's a theme, leadership, there's a guiding hand, God's hand that tells Yehuda to be the first leader, whatever that means. Then they're going to have some difficulties, they're gonna overcome and succeed. No, the story changed. God told them, no, I'm never going to let you succeed. I'm going to keep these nations and oppressions and temptations here for you to endure. This is going to be a story of endurance. And then they don't endure it too well. So the story changes again. And we're told that the pattern now is going to be this pattern of cycles that every time they're going to forget, not pass on the information, become the paros, become the villains of their own story. Then they're going to become the victims of their own story because by straying away from God, they open themselves to the punishment of being oppressed by other nations. Then God will have mercy on them and send chief stains, shoftim, judges to save them. And then the whole story will begin again. And I want to emphasize that the very fact that God will have to keep sending them judges and that the judges become the main 
attribute of the story, the main focal point of each little narrative unit in the book of Judges, instead of the people as a whole, is tragic. Because if for one second we allowed ourselves to believe that this is going to be the story of the people as such, now we're told, no, the story is becoming narrower again. Once again, it's going to be about unique individuals who somehow rise above the moment and lead the people with God's inspiration. Furthermore, while some of those judges will act on their own initiative, most of them are gonna act only because God taps them, like God tapped Yoshua which is, doesn't say anything bad about those judges, but it means that we're back to the old story of God being the mover and shaker and the people through this weird forgetfulness, through this loss of ties from past to future, um, become either the passive victims or the villains of the tale. This is a very depressing place to stop in, I know. But I do want to point out that it will get better. And the hint to the fact that it gets better is in the very beginning. The very beginning was the people asking who should be the leader and God says Yehuda. And at first, if anything, it doesn't look like such an optimistic sign because while Yehuda actually does fight one war successfully in this chapter, in the beginning of Shaftim, what we will see is that there's a certain progression, a certain negative progression in the book of Shaftim where slowly Yehuda loses leadership and the Shaftim, the judges come from tribes who live farther and farther and farther from Yehuda to the point that in the Samson saga, later in the book, or like almost towards the end of the book, the tribe of Yehuda captures Shimshon and surrenders him to the Philistines. Not only are they not leading the people against their enemies, they become collaborators out of fear for their own lives, not out of malice, but still they become the problem instead of the solution. And yet, as we all know, the solution to the situation of Shoptim, the man who's going to flip it all on its head will come from Shevet Yehuda, and that will be David. So already here in the beginning, even though we have all these disappointments ahead, even though we're going to have all these failures and changes and expectations and uh, frustrated hopes on the road ahead, we already have a tiny whisper that stays with us in the back of our mind, the whisper that one day we will encounter David and he is going to make uh, the story different. So I'm going to stop uh, today's, uh, today's narrative here. I would like to open it now to comments and uh, questions. I'll go back to the chat and look at um, some of your comments and questions. Um, just a moment. Um, Shayla writes, also Ladat suggests intimacy, like Ladat Vishcha, knowing someone in the biblical way, which they lost, which is a very good point that when Lo Yad Uet Hashem, they didn't know God, it's a very beautiful point. Thank you, Shayla. It's not just knowledge in the cerebral sense, it's like they lost some of the intimacy that's implied in this word in the Bible because this word is used for a marital relationship in the Bible. Uh, Joan Sachs wrote, in a way it reminds me of how recent generations don't remember how modern Israel came into being. This is important because they don't understand how complicated the story is of how modern Israeli reached this point in terms of how its existence was once supported by other nations and how other nations are now changing um, future generations change their minds. This is not making a political point. It is making the point that there is often a lack of knowledge of how Israel's situation is complicated, not as simple as either sides wants to portray it. And the question is who gets to judge? So in regards to that, thank you. This is a very good point. And I have to say that the first time around I taught this course, I was very judgmental of the Israelites for forgetting. Um, and I think that a few years difference uh, and watching the situation unfold right now does give me more sympathy to their reality that it's just something that happens when people forget. Uh, Gershon Hapner wrote, um, I, I can't understand. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not so clear. Uh, Gershon, would you like to explain your comment? Um, Rabbi Karaman, maybe you can help me here. I, I'm trying to figure out which word. I don't have the password for me. 
I'll take that one. Karim, and he saw Vayim Karim. Oh, Vayim Karim, you're right. Good point. Vayim Karim, right, that it says that God sold them, sold them. He didn't just give them, he sold them to those who would oppress them. Gershon writes, it implies that God caused the Jews to become slaves, just as Paro did when he did not know Joseph. Beautiful parallel. Thank you. Very beautiful. Um, another person wrote, and there's no name here, the stories were by and large written down long after the events, which were then known by all, so you could color it in different ways. Correct. It's The book of Judges stands out in how carefully crafted it is. It's not, you know, some of the books of the Bible, you kind of feel like they're written, not, I wouldn't go as far as to say they're written as stream of consciousness, but there's a certain uh, kind of fluidity, you know, this happens and then this happens and then this happens and you really need to dig deeper to try and understand if there's an underlying pattern. The book of Judges is very carefully constructed. The pattern is given to us. We already have the keys for understanding what's about to happen. Each one of the narrative units, usually it's a chapter or several chapters, in the book is structured in that cyclical pattern that we already know of forgetting God and sinning, being oppressed, being uh, uh, in distress, God choosing a judge, the judge saving them, the judge dying, going back to sinning, etc. Clearly it's here to teach us something. It's not here just to tell us the stories of our ancestors, it's to teach us something. And one of the questions we're going to be asking next week is what is it supposed to teach us today, here in the 21st century, when we're not a tribal society in the ancient uh, hillside. So we will definitely come back to that. Um, Mel wrote, what did your daughter say? I will get to this, I'll finish with that. Uh, Lauren Blatt wrote, it works out badly with judges, it works out badly with kings. That it's true, just as the judges seem like a sad compromise with the reality and that is an optimal thing. If we look at the expectations in the beginning of the book and then how it goes downhill afterwards, so happens with the kings. We will finish the story. This course will end on the high note of David's kingship. But anyone who read the book of Kings knows that then it becomes complicated. In other words, human nature doesn't allow for perfection over time. And that's something we have to take into account in our life. Um, uh, thank you for the people um, expressing their liking for the class. Um, Anybody else wants to add any questions, any thoughts, any uh, ideas before we before I tell you what my daughter said? Uh, Chaim Fruchter is asked. Fruchter wrote, "Why did Yeshua not appoint a successor?" So, I mean, obviously, I can't answer definitively in his name, but I think that when we look at that promise, when we look at that expectation that's created in the beginning of Shatim of the people taking the initiative, it almost looks like it's on purpose. Like he's giving them the opportunity to rise as a people. He warns them before his death, just like Moshe did before his death. He warns them to keep the covenant, but he gives them the opportunity to step up. And they then kind of do and mostly don't. And that's complicated. But we will follow that uh, moving forward. And I'll just tell you what my daughter said. So I told her, right, I said in the beginning that I'm going to teach a class about uh, storytelling and the rise of kings and then I gave her my whole long spiel and then she said but mommy I thought a class like that should be about castles and princesses so that was that okay so thank you very much for coming I hope to see you again next week thank you Rabbi Kalman for having me thank you very much our pleasure very nice and uh, thank you Yeshikoch and very nice how you worked in the audience that was very very nice and uh, okay we look forward to seeing you next week tomorrow we got a triple header Marty Lashin continues his series on Pshat, Rush, and Halakha, um, how various, how some things are in conflict and tension with each other tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. At 1 p.m., Simi Peters will be continuing, in many ways, sort of a follow-up to Malachim on Sefer Yirmiyahu. Uh, Simi Peters will be starting a 12-week course on Sefer Yirmiyahu tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. 8 o'clock in Israel, so please, please register for that if you have not done so. And Moshe Sokolo will continue his weekly Haftorah class at 8 p.m. Uh, Rachel, if you want to get up, that's at 3 in the morning uh, where you are. And uh, thank God you can sleep through the night now, and you don't have to get up and, you know, whatever, Hamei Vinyavin, of course. And uh, 
Thursday, Shuli Mishkin will begin her series on touring the land of Israel at 11 a.m. Eastern, and Rabbi Noah Chezis will be giving the Parsha Shir um, on Thursday night, and I'll be giving the Perkei, the par I'll be giving the Perkei Avot Shir 9.30 a.m. Friday morning, so we look forward to learning with you. Uh, please invite a friend to join, and uh, everybody be well, be safe, and uh, we look forward to learning with you, and Rachel, thank you. How old is your daughter now, may I ask? She's seven years old. Oh, she's seven years old. And she's an excellent storyteller. Okay, okay. So she's in grade two? <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Finished in grade two now. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. Okay, great. Thank you. Look forward to speaking with you. Okay, be well, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Laila Tov.